On the 5th of June 1967, Israel launched an all-out war on its Arab neighbors. In just six days, Israel defeated three Arab armies and tripled its land area. The map of the Middle East was dramatically changed. These land gains remain to this day among the thorniest of problems in the Arab-Israeli conflict. But what caused the event that's become known as the Six-Day War? We knew that for us, for a small air force, for a small country, which is surrounded by few air forces, this is the only solution. You have to attack them before they'll attack you. If they were attacking us, it was a disaster. We knew it. At the time, international opinion viewed the tiny Jewish state as being surrounded by Arab enemies that were poised to attack and crush it. But on the 5th of June 1967, did Israel react in self-defense to the military measures of its Arab neighbors? Or was the Israeli airstrike known as Operation Focus in fact conceived many years before? We were training for this operation for years before 1967. The idea was to destroy the Arab air forces on the ground and therefore to give ourselves air superiority. This is no secret. We prepared for this for a long time. Prior to 1967, this area marked the border between Israel and Jordan. The main Israeli population centers on the coast were a mere 15 kilometers away. Therefore, any Arab attack through the West Bank would have cut the country in two and severely endangered Israeli civilians. Israel's northern border provided no more comfort. The Syrian Golan Heights, with its strategic elevation, posed a threat to the Israeli towns below. And to the south, Israel was facing the danger of an Egyptian ground assault through the Negev Desert. This would have deprived Israel of its only access to the Red Sea, the port of Eilat. Israel faced a dangerous geopolitical problem. It lacked strategic depth on all fronts. The Suez Crisis of 1956 was the first real opportunity Israel had to try to solve this problem. The Jewish state enthusiastically joined Britain and France in their attack on Egypt and its audacious leader, Jamal Abdel Nasser, who had nationalized the Suez Canal in defiance of the West. Israel succeeded in capturing the entire Sinai Peninsula, but was forced, under heavy international pressure, to pull its troops out in March 1957. Yet despite the withdrawal, Israel achieved important strategic benefits from the campaign. The stationing of UN emergency forces on the borders with Egypt and Gaza prevented Arab guerrilla attacks. And Israeli ships were allowed free passage to Elat through the Tiran Straits, although these were still claimed by Egypt as domestic waters. By the end of the 1956 war, it was clear that there was another round brewing between Israel and Egypt. Israel realized that this time it would be it alone that must carry out a sudden airstrike against the Egyptian Air Force. A strike like that which the British and the French had carried out in the opening stages of the Suez Crisis. Israel focused its preparations on its air force, acquiring the latest aircraft from France. Israeli pilots began tough training regimes in the Negev desert, 
simulating air-to-ground attacks on mock Arab airfields. The pilot training was combined with intelligence gathering on the Arab air forces. Long-range photo reconnaissance flights were made over neighboring Arab countries throughout the mid-1960s. The intelligence work before was fantastic. He uh, ran on and did a flight over all the, all the bases, the Egyptian air, air bases in a very low uh, altitude. And he took a panoramic picture. I saw the pictures a few months before the war, and I was amazed, like you, like you have it now in the television. For its part, the Egyptian Air Force did not seem to be on a war footing. Our aircraft were parked in the airfields as if they were in Zurich airport. They were exposed with no shelters and no air defense. As if Israel wasn't enough of a foe to contend with, Egypt had been involved in a costly and dirty war in Yemen since 1962. As the champion of pan-Arabism, Nasser showed little hesitation in backing his political rhetoric with military force. He sent Egyptian troops into Yemen to support nationalist forces in the country's civil war. By the mid-1960s, almost one-third of Egypt's armed forces were in Yemen, draining Egypt's war coffers. The war in Yemen was leaving Egypt vulnerable and distracted on its home front. A surreal incident in February 1966 exposed the weakness of the Egyptian air defense system. An Israeli peacemaker landed his plane in Fayyid airfield and asked to meet President Nasser. We were shocked and serious questions were raised. How did this guy cross this distance with his primitive plane from Israel over Sinai and land in an airfield next to the Suez Canal without being detected. There was to be more humiliation for the Arab Air Force. This is a Soviet-made MiG-21, which today stands in the Israeli Air Force Museum. It's painted with the number 007, the number of fictional British agent James Bond, a fitting number for a tale of daring international espionage. On August the 16th, 1966, an Iraqi pilot defected with the plane and landed in Israel. It was a stunning blow to the Iraqi Air Force, to Arab pride, and more importantly, to Arab efforts at keeping the MiG's unique features a secret from their enemies. This rare and exclusive footage of the plane from 1966 has only recently been released by the Israelis. By getting their hands on the MiG-21, the Israelis gained the opportunity to discover the strengths and weaknesses of the Arab Air Force's latest jet fighter. It's believed that the Israelis had offered the Iraqi pilot one million US dollars to defect. For the Israelis, it was worth every cent. Danny Shapira, our chief test pilot of the Air Force, checked the aeroplane and we knew all its disadvantages of the MiG-21, which was the aeroplane of the war in the enemy hands. What the Israelis learned about the MiG was soon put to the test in actual combat. On April the 7th, 1967, a minor border incident escalated into a full-scale aerial battle over the Golan Heights. A dogfight involving Syrian MiG-21s and Israeli Mirages ended with six MiGs downed and no Israeli planes were lost. The testing of the defected MiG-21 had borne fruit for Israel. Arab-Israeli tension continued to rise in the following weeks. Tough Israeli rhetoric against the Syrians, together with a widespread rumor that Israel was preparing to invade Syria, combined to persuade Nasser that he needed to take action. On the 14th of May 1967, Nasser ordered Egyptian troops to march into Sinai. The Egyptian forces entered the Sinai without any intentions or plans to attack Israel. 
The idea was that the presence of 130,000 Egyptian soldiers on the Israeli borders would stop Israel from invading Syria. On the 16th of May, Egypt asked the UN to evacuate their emergency forces from their positions along the Egyptian-Israeli borders. Sitting among Egyptian pilots on the 22nd of May, Nasser announced the closing of the Tehran Strait to Israeli shipping. By these actions, Nasser hoped to deprive the Israelis of the gains they'd made following the Suez Crisis. But the Israelis considered his provocations a declaration of war. We were not ready for the war. Almost half of the Egyptian army was in Yemen. The Egyptian armed forces hadn't launched a single mass army drill for 10 years. The training of our air force was done in an outdated, weak and impractical way. On the 30th of May, King Hussein of Jordan arrived in Cairo to sign a defense treaty with Nasser. Other Arab countries announced their readiness to send troops to support Egypt, Syria and Jordan. Events were gaining momentum. This Arab show of strength was met by hysteria in Israel. Anti-Israeli rhetoric from the likes of Nasser, together with memories of the Holocaust, was used by the media to persuade many in Israel that it was facing a threat to its very existence. A pretext for those who wanted war in Israel had arrived. And Israel's newly formed unity government gave the green light to the Israeli Air Force to launch Operation Focus. The night before the war, I received all the information I needed, the numbers, the types and the locations of the aircraft in Al-Arish, the airfield I would attack the next day.